Hi everyone, this is Professor M. Das Science, and today I'm going to talk about angular momentum eigenvalues in another one of our videos on rigorous quantum mechanics. Angular momentum is a key property in classical mechanics, where the orbital angular momentum is central in many problems. If anything, angular momentum is actually even more important in quantum mechanics, where we not only have the orbital variant, but we also have spin angular momentum, which does not have a classical analog. This means that in quantum mechanics, you will come across angular momentum eigenvalues all the time. There is a companion video linked in the description where we derive angular momentum eigenvalues mathematically, showing that they are quantized. What I want to do in this video is to discuss the language that is typically used when discussing angular momentum eigenvalues. Among other things, we will discuss some widely used but actually somewhat confusing conventions. We will look at a few examples of allowed angular momentum, and we will also anticipate some of the key differences between orbital and spin angular momentum. So let's go! As always, let's start with the summary of angular momentum in quantum mechanics. We consider a vector operator J made of three operators J1, J2, and J3. This operator J will be an angular momentum operator if the three components obey these commutation relations. And here I'm using the levi civita symbol and the convention that we sum over repeated indices k. If these ideas don't sound familiar to you, then you should first check out the video that introduces angular momentum. J is a general angular momentum, and it includes the orbital angular momentum that we're familiar with from classical mechanics, and that we typically label with the letter L. And it also includes a spin angular momentum that doesn't have a classical analogue, and for which we use the letter S. As we can see up here, the different angular momentum components don't commute, which implies that they don't form a set of compatible observables. But we know from the video on angular momentum that we can define another operator j squared equal to j1 squared plus j2 squared plus j3 squared that does commute with each individual component. This means that in the quantum theory of angular momentum, we can build a set of compatible observables by considering j squared and one of the components ji, and we conventionally use j3. We now build the theory of angular momentum in quantum mechanics with these two compatible observables j squared and j3. The key equations are the eigenvalue equations, which for j squared takes this form where the eigenvalue is lambda, and for J3 we have this eigenvalue equation, where the eigenvalue is mu. These eigenstates here and here are a common set of eigenstates for the two commuting observables, and I label them with the eigenvalues lambda and mu, so that this is clear. In the companion video on angular momentum eigenvalues, we found out that the eigenvalues lambda and mu cannot take just any arbitrary value, but instead can only take a set of special values. Lambda is always given by j, j plus 1, h bar squared, where j can only take the values 0, 1 half, 1, 3 halves, 2, 5 halves, 3, and so on, in steps of 1 half. The values 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on are obviously integers, and we call the values 1 half, 3 halves, 5 halves, and so on, half integers. Half integer simply means that we pick an odd integer and divide it by 2. Once we have determined the value of j from this list, then mu is always given by this form, m h bar, and m can only take the values minus j, minus j plus 1, minus j plus 2, and so on in steps of 1, all the way to j minus 1 and finally j. And this list here contains two j plus 1 possible values for m. So this is it for the angular momentum eigenvalues. In the companion video, I go into a lot of detail over the mathematical derivation as to why these are the only allowed eigenvalues of j squared and j3. Today's video, you'll be happy to hear, is much lighter on the maths front, and I instead focus on some important concepts that we need to be familiar with relating to these eigenvalues. 
So let's start with a sanity check and just confirm that these eigenvalues have the correct units for an angular momentum. The key insight is to realize that Planck's constant and similarly the reduced Planck constant both have units of angular momentum. Planck's constant is a fundamental physical constant, which since 2019 is actually defined to have the exact value h equals 6.62607015 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times second in SI units. Historically, Planck's constant was the proportionality constant between the energy and the frequency of a quantum of light called a photon. You can straight away check that the units of energy being joules and those of frequency being inverseconds leads to the units of h being joules times second. So what is the dimension of the Planck's constant then? It is basically equal to energy times time. There are various ways in which we can spell out energy, so let's just pick the infinitesimal work done by displacing a particle using a force f by some infinitesimal distance dr. This means that the dimension of energy is force times length, and in turn, using Newton's second law, we get that force is equal to mass times acceleration, so that the dimension of force is equal to mass times length divided by time squared. Putting everything together, we get that the dimension of Planck's constant is equal to mass times length squared divided by time. If we now write the familiar formula for orbital angular momentum L as r cross p, then we have that the dimension of r is length, and the dimension of momentum is mass times length divided by time. So overall we get that the dimension of angular momentum is mass times length squared divided by time. Comparing the dimension of Planck's constant with the dimension of angular momentum, we see that they are indeed the same. Therefore, the fact that the eigenvalue of j squared is proportional to h bar squared is consistent with j squared being the square of an angular momentum. And similarly, the fact that the eigenvalue of j3 is proportional to h bar is also consistent with j3 being an angular momentum component. The next topic I want to discuss relates to conventions about notation. We started with these general eigenvalue equations for j squared and for j3, with the corresponding eigenvalues lambda and mu. But now that we know that lambda can only take these values, with j in turn given by this, and that mu can only take these values, where m is given by this, it then makes sense to replace all lambdas and mu's by their allowed values. In particular, we can do this for the common set of eigenstates, and we could write them like this. However, in practice, we simplify the notation and write these eigenstates as jn. In this language, the eigenvalue equation for j squared becomes this, and the eigenvalue equation for j3 becomes this. Another important simplification that is used when working with angular momentum is that for a system in eigenstate jm, we typically say that this is a state with angular momentum j. Now, this language is used constantly, so it is very important to become familiar with it. But it is also essential that you don't forget what an eigenstate jm really means. It means that the j squared eigenvalue is j times j plus 1 times h bar squared, and that the j3 eigenvalue is m h bar. We're now ready to look at a few examples of angular momentum eigenvalues and eigenstates. Let's start by placing the relevant quantities at the top, starting with j, then the j squared eigenvalue, then m, then the j3 eigenvalue, and then the corresponding eigenstate. The first possible j value in the list is j equals 0. The eigenvalue is trivially 0. m is also 0, and so is the j3 eigenvalue, so this is an easy case. 
there is a single eigenstate which we label by 0, 0. Let's now look at the next possible j value in the list, which is j equals 1 half. For the j squared eigenvalue, we plug in 1 half in the usual expression, which multiplies to 3 over 4 h bar squared. There are now two possible values of m. The first is minus j, so minus 1 half, and the second is plus j, so plus 1 half. These two m values give two possible eigenvalues, minus 1 half h bar and plus 1 half h bar. There are two eigenstates for j equals 1 half, which are 1 half minus 1 half and 1 half plus 1 half. If we now move on to the next eigenvalue in the list, we get j equals 1. We can plug in the value 1 in the j squared eigenvalue expression, and overall we get 2 h bar squared. There are now three possible values for m. The first is minus j, so minus 1. Then we add 1 to get 0, and we add 1 again to get plus 1. And this is it because plus 1 is now already equal to j. These three m values give three possible j3 eigenvalues, minus h bar, 0, and plus h bar. And looking at the eigenstates, we also have three, and they are labelled by 1 minus 1, 1 0, and 1 plus 1. You can now see how this would continue for other allowed values of j and the corresponding m, so you should be able to build basically any combination that you need. For most of our discussion of angular momentum, we've used a general definition of angular momentum. However, we know that we can be more specific and discuss the special case of orbital angular momentum, which is analogous to the corresponding quantity in classical mechanics, and we also have the spin angular momentum, which is a purely quantum mechanical quantity. We also know that we label a general angular momentum using the letter j, but that when we want to specify orbital angular momentum, we instead use the letter l, and for spin angular momentum, we use the letter s. As you can imagine, we use similar changes in our notation when we talk about eigenvalues and eigenstates. The j squared eigenvalue label small j is typically replaced by the label small l for orbital angular momentum, and by the label small s for spin angular momentum. The corresponding eigenvalues read as usual for the general case, and then for the orbital they are in terms of l, and for spin in terms of s. For the j3 eigenvalue label m, if there is no possibility of confusion, then we also typically just use m for both orbital and spin angular momentum. However, if we have a system in which multiple types of angular momentum must be included at the same time, then we can use m subindex l for orbital and m subindex s for spin to avoid any kind of confusion. For the sake of clarity, in the rest of the video, I will use ML and MS. But remember that we can have either option and it should be clear what is meant by the context. In this more involved notation, the corresponding eigenvalues read MH bar, MLH bar, and MSH bar. And finally, the eigenstates JM become LML for orbital and SMS for spin. Feel free to explore our other videos for examples of orbital and spin angular momenta that you can find linked in the description. The very final thing I want to do is to anticipate some of the discussion in the videos on orbital and spin angular momentum. Let's consider again our eigenvalue equation for j squared and for j3. And remember again that small j can be 0, 1 half, 1, 3 halves, 2, and so on. And that for a given j, then m can be any of the values minus j, minus j plus 1, all the way to j in steps of 1. We derive these allowed values in the companion video on angular momentum eigenvalues, and the only assumption behind that derivation is the defining commutation relation of the angular momentum operator j. That derivation tells us that these here are the possible values of j and m. But in fact, the derivation does not tell us that they must all occur, only that they can occur. 
As we discuss in the corresponding videos, it turns out that when we have orbital angular momentum, then the only values of j that can occur are the integer values. So if you use the notation introduced in the previous slide, this means that small l can only be 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on in integer steps. And as a consequence, ml must also be an integer. The story is completely different with spin angular momentum. In this case, j can take both integer or half integer values. Perhaps the most important example of spin angular momentum is that of spin one half, where again, using the notation from the previous slide, we have small s equal to one half, and then ms can be either minus one half or plus one half. Spin one half is central in quantum mechanics because the electron happens to be a spin one half particle. This means that to study anything ranging from the simplest atom to the most complex material, the theory of spin one half angular momentum is a must. In this video, we've done some necessary bookkeeping to make sure that we have the right language to work with angular momentum. You're now ready to explore many topics in which angular momentum is key from the differences between orbital and spin angular momenta to the hydrogen atom. And don't forget to check out the mathematical derivation of angular momentum eigenvalues in the companion video. And as always, if you liked the video, please subscribe.